now we get to dive into the world of, of salmon and steelhead here, local fishies for, um, with Sarah Gallagher. And uh, yeah, anyway, I think I will just go ahead and introduce Sarah. Um, thank you everybody for joining tonight. Um, I've been wanting to connect with the Noyo Center regarding salmon for a while. Um, it seems like there are marine species, but we don't think of them like that all the time. And they're definitely, they live half their life cycle in freshwater and half their life cycle in the marine. So I'm really excited to um, connect in this sense. I will share up front, I'm not a, I really don't study their ecology in the marine environment. So it's not as familiar to me. Um, but anyway, I'm, what I hope to do today is um, share about some of the work that we do right out of Fort Bragg to do to monitor our local salmon and steelhead. Um, I'm a senior environmental scientist with the department. Um, I've only been in this position for about two years, so I'm a little bit newer to coastal um, salmonids, but I've been working with salmon and steelhead in California for the last 20 years. Um, I was working in the Central Valley before that, so a little bit different, spe uh, same species, different runs, a little bit different, but very um, similar things. So I'm going to open up my presentation if that works. Bear with me. And I don't know if anyone's um, out of, I don't know how, if everyone's pretty local here. I thought my mom was going to join, but I don't see her. Um, but anyway, I am a local here in Fort Bragg, like I said, and I work here right down in the harbor. Is Trey still here? Yeah, I think it's gonna work. Am I, did sure. I get it? Yeah. Okay. How does that look? I just wanna make sure everything's, you see my, my front screen? Looks good, looks okay. beautiful. Everything's um, fitting perfectly too, which I've seen when that doesn't happen. That doesn't always. Okay, again, so what my talk tonight is about is the salmon and steelhead of coastal Mendocino County, California. Uh, there's a couple pictures here of a coho salmon and a, a red, a nest that they build in the river, and then there's an adult over here on the right. So, so my, an overview of what I want to talk to you about is the basic ecology of our Pacific salmon here, just to start. Um, I'm going to focus on our local watersheds, and I'll show you some maps and pictures of those. I'm sure many of you have visited and been around a lot of these watersheds. I'm going to talk about the decline of the salmon and when that happened and, and why, and then the, and their subsequent listing under the Endangered Species Act. Um, I'm going to focus a lot on our mon the monitoring work that we do. It's a, a monitoring project to look at the status and trends of these species. And so when you know the status and trends and how many there are, you're able to manage them. It's a very important part. And that's really what my primary um, focus is, is that we monitor the salmon. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple, some of the management strategies um, that we can, we are working on actively. Um, there's a huge community um, that is working on restoration and water conservation. And I see some of the people in the audience here today that are, that are have actively been part of that. And then I'm going to show some of the data so you can know, I think that's a burning question. How are the fish doing? Everybody wants to know that. And so I'm going to try to share some of that with you. Um, picture I've got there on the right is just a, one of our, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure which one creek this is, but it, it's doing a spawning survey and walking up one of the rivers um, while they're spawning. So just to highlight some of the key points I hope to take away too is that our local watersheds are home to native salmon and steelhead and they're all at risk of extinction like I mentioned. Um, their status, we're doing status and trend monitoring um, to inform the recovery. And as we're all seeing now climate change um, models, we're really predicting some hydrologic changes that are really gonna impact the salmon and they're currently impacting the salmon. We really see that expression in a year like that. And I'll, I'll give some examples of um, how we think that will impact the salmon in freshwater and in the ocean. Um, and then just to, to highlight, and many of you all know this, this, we really need to take a careful planning and long-term vision to balance ecosystem and um, community health. And that involves um, making our watersheds healthy, including um, thinking about how we do long-term planning and, and water management. Um, so um, 
just want to shout out right out in the beginning, um, a lot of the work we do and all of these things we do to restore the salmon is, is a huge community and, a, and support um, of people, um, including many, many private landowners that allow us access to their property just to do the surveys. And so um, here's just a few of those people. Um, the map on the right is our, our, our area and where I'm going to be focusing is this little star um, right in the Mendocino County watershed. But you'll see all of these watersheds that are focused here, they all have salmon all the way up from, um, well, I'll show a bigger map in a minute, but these are all kind of blocking off places where we have salmon and steelhead um, in some of the bigger rivers, Russian River, the Klamath. So, but this is the zone I'll be focusing in. Um, it's, it's not only is it a, a, a crisis going on just in our local community, but Salmon um, are distributed, the Pacific salmon are distributed quite um, in a big range. And so I just wanted to show you the bigger picture at first. Um, and we have six species of North American uh, salmon that are in our area. Um, there's more when you start to go up across the ocean here. And this one is, my screen's getting hidden right now, so I can't see. There we go, these are coho salmon. Um, this is the distribution of coho salmon. The green is where they're currently distributed. The red is where they once were. You can see there's some extirpated places here. So coho salmon is one of the species we'll be talking about today. Chinook salmon are another, and here's their current distribution. And you can see here too, um, lots of red zones where they've been extirpated. Um, a lot of these have to do with um, the building of rim dams when they can no longer get upstream. And then our last is steelhead. Um, sometimes you hear them called a salmon, um, sometimes not, but they are in the, in the same family. And so here's the distribution of, of salmon. And you'll see again, too, we've got some, some red zones and places they've been extirpated. So now to, to break it back down, um, we have, like I, we're going to be talking about um, three species here. And I'm sorry, I gotta move my little cursor again. Is it, um, Sarah, can I ask a quick question just technically? Is it, am I blocking anything mm -hmm. on the screen with the, um, with the icons? I'm wondering if it's blocking any. No. Okay, great. No, it all looks really good and your cursor is really tiny, so. Okay, okay, thank you. Oh, that's a good point. I should know that if it's too tiny. Um, I'll try to use visual or I'll try to use my hands or something different to, to explain where I'm talking about. Oh, no, your cursor works great. It's, it's oh, okay, good. Super helpful, yeah, it, and it, uh, yeah, it's not blocking anything. Okay. Everything looks perfect. Okay, I just wanted to check on that before I keep going and miss yeah. something. But anyway, now to focus back down on, so coho salmon, um, we have them here. And these blue lines, again, I just wanted you to hone in. This is where we're gonna be talking about, but right now I wanted to say that we have two, one species of coho salmon, but there's different, we have what we, different evolution of significant units. And so what we have in our zone, and these are listed as endangered, are the Central California Coast Salmon. Just to the north of us, up in the Eel River and those other locations, we have what we call the Southern um, Oregon, Northern California, or the Sonk Coho Salmon. And so you can kind of see this, the distribution has a lot to do with geography and how they adapt to their um, environments. They're very much, um, they adapt to different conditions. And so they have different genetics. As you can imagine, up in Alaska, they have some, a very different climate up there where it's colder and wetter. And so they're going to be adapting um, a little differently where they might stay in fresh water longer. Down here, we're in California, we're at the southern edge of the range of um, all salmonids. And so we have more extreme climate. Um, they're adapted a little bit differently. So there's a nice, beautiful picture of a coho. If anyone hasn't seen one up close, one of the really identifying unique things to look on a coho is if you see uh, right on his nose, that's a, uh, it's just a white nose nostril, nair we call it. It's a really unique thing. Um, this salmon is in the freshwater right now and he's got his spawning colors on. He's got a big hooked nose. That's something they develop when they, when they spawn. And um, anyway, that's some of the unique things about a salmon. You don't always see these characteristics if you're out in the ocean fishing. It's a little bit different and you'll be looking for different things. Um, which includes inside their mouth. Um, Coco have black inside their mouth, and then they'll have a, you can see that pretty good here, a white line right along their, bump, their jawline. So that's one thing that um, you can use when you're trying to distinguish them from Chinook salmon. Okay. 
Um, so next, just wanted to share. So we also have um, coastal Chinook salmon here. Um, there's Chinook salmon, as you saw earlier, that range up north and all the way into the Central Valley. But what we have here are the coastal Chinook and they are listed as threatened. And then finally, um, steelhead. Um, we, we have Northern California steelhead again listed as threatened. And just to the south of us, we have Central California coast steelhead listed as threatened. And I don't have that on the map, but steelhead actually expand down quite a bit further, um, all the way down, used to be maybe town to Mexico. I don't think they've got there that far now, but we also have another um, um, populations that exist down there. I'm not gonna talk about, but they're actually listed as endangered. And then there's many other different populations um, inland. Here's a beautiful picture. Um, actually, I'm going to back up one. Just wanted to highlight, I forgot to say about the Chinook. Some of the really unique things about a Chinook, especially when they're, um, if you handle them or see them in, the difference with Chinook are these dots on their back. They kind of look like peanut markings. That's a really unique characteristic um, of a Chinook when you're comparing them to a coho. They're much bigger. They're known as kings often too. Um, and inside their mouth, if you looked in there, it's all black. So that's a, a really um, good way to tell them apart. And with steelhead, um, a lot of times they're smaller um, or they can be quite big as this one here. And a really unique thing about the steelhead is that they have white in their mouth. So if um, those are the three things that as adults and you're handling them or fishing for them, you can really kind of use that to distinguish them. So like I said, that those three pieces of all the different populations are gonna come together and here is our study area. This is the Mendocino coastal watersheds that um, I work in and they contain these three, um, three ESUs of coho, chinook, and steelhead. Um, just to highlight the yellow is where we do our sampling um, in this, on the spawning grounds. And I don't know how familiar you are with most of our rivers. Uh, the bigger rivers are um, labeled with bigger font and highlighted. And so 10 Mile, Noyo River, Big River, Elvian River, uh, Navarro, the Garcia, and actually the, uh, the Wallala as well. Um, just part of it is in our county, but it's not something we monitor. Um, those are our larger rivers. They have the strongest populations of salmon, but many of these other smaller um, watersheds also have populations of Sam, of Coho. Um, Chinook, are, they tend to be in the bigger rivers, um, like Big River and Ten Mile, Navarro and Garcia, where Coho will be found in, in most of these watersheds and Steelhead in all of them. So I said we have three and we mostly do, but occasionally we, we will get um, these other um, and it's, it's not uncommon to have them. We don't have enough to do population monitoring. It's not their normal range, but we have um, a chum and sockeye and, and also pink that occasionally will show up. So those are some of the other, they're much more prevalent up north, um, up in Alaska and not so much down here. We're really at their southern end of the range. Again, our, so our water, I just want to describe our watersheds a little bit. Um, and they're mainly coniferous redwood forest. Um, once you get up higher into the, some of the watersheds, they, they become um, more oak woodland and, and drier and warmer. But for the most part where our salmon are and where we're monitoring is um, more towards the coast. Um, they're, all, they're almost all unregulated um, and flow directly in the Pacific Ocean. That's pretty rare. Um, if you look at a lot of California, there's a lot of dams. And so these smaller watersheds here, well, there's diversions and some different things. We don't, there's none that are really dams, um, which is really important for salmon. Um, there's a mix of bar built and riverine estuaries. And so what a bar built estuary is, is when the flows get lower, they'll close off. And so that will truncate fish moving in and out. Um, and Timber agriculture residential is, is mostly the land use. Um, one of the reasons that I think the salmon do so well here is because we don't have huge populations. We have big tracts of land that they um, are not being necessarily developed. There's, there's timber and there's different things going on, but it's one of the reasons that um, we have um, some of the strongest probably coho populations um, in, in the state for CCP coho.
Um, again, these systems are groundwater and rain fed. Um, peak stream flows occur in the winter time, and um, that's when our salmon are moving upstream and they're moving downstream as juveniles as after they have uh, come up out of the ground or they have spent a year in the um, freshwater rearing. Um, and like I would just mention, those estuaries um, will close um, to the ocean during the low flow period. So that some, this is something like 10 Mile River or Quitting, Quitting Creek, those are two places and is people have probably seen the Navarro very clearly um, as a bar built estuary and it's closed. Um, this closed, these, these estuaries are definitely, um, it's a normal thing for them to close in some years. Um, when we have a drought like this, they close much earlier um, and they open much later, which really impacts um, the life history of the salmon as well. Because they're very dependent on getting in water. Well, I always say water is the, the most basic um, fish habitat. It, it really is um, that's something they, they don't have that. There's not much. And this is one of the toughest years um, that we've seen. So um, like I just mentioned, some of the best populations of sea, sea, sea coho exist here. So we really have a, a real treasure here. I think that um, we have, they, it's not to say they're recovered and they're very low populations, but um, it's doing better than some of the other areas. Here's just a picture of the 10 mile when it's open and when it's closed. Um, and it's not, it's not uncommon, like I said, for these to, to, to close in the summer, they usually do. Um, but what, what's changing with the climate is that it's, it's truncating when these rain events come and therefore it could truncate the opening of a bar for when salmon wanna come in. So um, really can change, um, really could, like we saw actually in 2014, um, it, what happens is if they, if they can't get in, they often will perish. We had a year when we didn't have any salmon return. So it is a real possibility well, when that happens. So fortunately that did not happen this year. Um, I just wanted to touch on, so all of these things we just talked about were important for salmon or with the habitat they live in and, and the dependence on the wet, um, the water cycle. Um, I wanted to just show you guys um, stream flows from the last few years. And what I'm showing here is from January, 2017, and it's extending all the way out until um, till now. And what you can see is 2017 was a, a pretty wet year. And so the Navarro River had nice peak, these are peak flows, um, high flows, a healthy thing to have the, for the river uh, moving through. This was good to let salmon up and juveniles go out. Um, when we moved into 2018, that was not, it was a kind of intermediate year. It didn't look like there was many peak flows. Um, jump forward into 2019, you can see there was a um, high flows. Um, I didn't put it at a scale when you can actually see the timing very well, but I um, think it was probably at an appropriate time so fish could get up. But then you can look at our last two years. And I know that we're all real familiar with what this is looking like right now. And uh, uh, I, ju I just think it's important to see what a dry year looks like compared to a wet year. And um, if I zoomed in a little bit closer, you'd see that we didn't have flows um, enough to open up some of the bars until um, January. And so we were really pushing on the edge of um, need about six to seven inches to open some of the bars and to get flows up enough and sort of like the Noyo to get fish moved up. And so that's what we were experiencing these last two years. Um, and so Okay, so just I just want to break into the, the life cycle of the, the salmon a little bit. Um, like I think I've mentioned, they're very they're highly migratory fish. They they swim thousands of miles. They go from the freshwater to the ocean. And so um, what I have right here on the right, it's a very old graph uh, graph, but I really like it. Um, it it's a, it's for coho specifically, um, and so our chinook and our steelhead are a little bit different. But in general, it shows the pattern. Um, what I, what we have on the left is. The, the size of the fish. And on the bottom, we have um, the time, the dates. Oops. And so it starts when we have about, in, here's December here. And so that's when our fish come up into spawn. And I'll get into that in a minute. Um, and then lay their eggs and emerge. And the really important thing 
to know about these fish is that um, they spent, coho and steelhead spend a whole full year in freshwater. It's, it's variable. And we found some, from some of our monitoring, and this happens further north, that coho actually will spend a second year, similar to steelhead. So our, so our, these small fish will actually spend up to two years, steelhead can be even longer, in fresh water before they go up to the ocean. So um, this is showing still through time them going to the ocean, and then where they're putting on massive growth, um, they spend one or two years out in the ocean and then and then return. So this is just kind of a view of how they grow over time and when they spur off and um, stay in the fresh water or go to the ocean. It's important um, to know when I say, um, sometimes they spend one year, since sometimes they spend two years. It's really important to the, the diversity of the, the species because you may have a year where it's really dry and you have not very good success with your run, but you may have juveniles that stay a whole nother year that kind of make up for that. And so salmon show a lot of diversity because they need to, to, to survive through these kind of conditions. Some of the key habitat needs, unimpaired flows from the headwaters to the ocean, um, water quality and quantity that provides adults access to the spawning grounds and conditions for successful egg incubation that supports juvenile and like I mentioned, year round. Um, another important thing they need is very clean spawning gravel and habitat that's um, complex for rearing. And the little guys, when they come out, they need to be able to hide um, and find food and be protected from high flows that come through and also find places that don't dry up in the, in the summer. So um, I'm just gonna step through each stage. So spawning again, coho and chinook both die after they spawn. It's called their semilparis. They have one reproductive cycle and then they die. Um, steelhead are what we call iteroparous. And so they actually return back and forth um, to the ocean several times in their lifetime. So they'll spawn more than once. So they're a little bit unique in that where they, um, they actually need to um, go back out to the ocean um, and come back again. The mag, like I mentioned, magnitude and timing of the flow really impacts our spawning, if, whether it be flows of, enable them to get up into the watersheds or just those bars opening. Um, and here's a picture of a red, it's a, it's what we, it's a salmon nest. Um, this is a nice graphic here showing how they actually build it. They're coming up, they're building their reds in between, um, in shallow riffles in between pool crests and, um, or it, it tail, pool tail crests and riffles. Um, they really hydraulically mine up that gravel. You can see here a female digging with her um, tail, digging up the, the gravel. Um, and then the males are here waiting to deposit their um, sperm. And the gravel, the eggs will get buried um, somewhere around in, in this zone. You can see the flow is going this way. And so then they'll go down there and they'll spend, the eggs will incubate for one or two months. Um, and then they hatch and they actually continue to live down in that, in the gravel for um, another month before they'll actually emerge up as fry and go out. So they actually really need to stay down in that gravel. They're living off of their yolk sac. Um, and here to the right is a picture of an actual red. Um, and there's a person there looking at it. Here's the stream flow going this way. But I don't know if anyone's seen these out in the river, but it just looks like disturbed substrate. It, it looks cleaner. and. Um, that's a salmon red. I want to see if my video will play because this is kind of cool. Wanted to share. I don't know, again, how many people have seen salmon spawning out in the wilderness, but it's it's a pretty beautiful thing, and um, I I highly recommend if you haven't spent time out on the rivers to get out there and and watch. Um, and it's sometime between when the rains fall in late November, uh, all the way through spring. Um, I'll say that the timing, like the coho and the chinook will come in usually as soon as we get enough rain, November time, and then um, steelhead will air a little bit later. They come up late December and then their peak spawning is more um, in the springtime. So, so we have what we have right here are two coho um, males, actually. There's no female in there right now. And they're, um, they're fighting each other. <laughs> Just then trying to find the female. 
uh, to get their sperm deposited. So anyway, beautiful fish. I think I, I think I see that on one of them. I can't be sure. Um, they have a foy tag and that's like a, 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 I'm not sure if it has it on there. I'll go over that a little bit later, but it's a way that we mark our fish to, to count them. So um, anyway, that's a spawning salmon. Done. Makes me happy to see it, and I've seen it a million times. So. so something like I mentioned, they dive when they, they after they spawn, and they bring something really special back from the ocean. Marine derived nutrients, we call that. Um, they have been living out in the ocean for years, and so one thing to think about how for the health of our forests and how important that connection is with salmon um, is that they actually um, are responsible for bringing marine nutrients back up into these um, systems. Um, there's studies that they have done when they look in tree rings and they can see the marine nutrients. The bears eat them, they spread them around. The insects, as you can see in this picture, these are caddis flies um, munching away on a, a carcass. And so they really get redistributed into the environment. And I, I think that's one of the really important parts about having salmon, they're, they're connected um, to so many things. If you lose a salmon, what more, you, you lose a lot. Um, it, they're very connected, everything's de dependent on them. So, and like I said, they nourish freshwater and terrestrial. So uh, I, fish, they, I gave you the spawn timing, they hatch, they're pretty much coming, these coho, chinook, and steelhead are all coming up um, in the springtime, hatching, and then they start to redistribute and they find places to live. Now they're looking for um, cover in the form of um, large wood or woody debris. Um, they have a coho and still have a little bit um, different places that they live in the stream. Coho lights really are more associated with what you think of the, in the redwood forest with, in pools, slow water. This video I'm showing right now is um, some coho. And I apologize, I did a terrible job with my GoPro, um, but you can see those little guys popping around. These were on the Garcia River um, this year. We had a good run and we were out looking for them. And so, yeah, they're hanging out in this pretty slow water. This may have been an isolated pool. Um, they can survive in isolated pools all summer, but um, really depends on oxygen levels and different stuff. <clears throat> I think with uh, if, you, if you ever get your snorkel on and go look out on the river, um, one of the things that makes little coho stand out, um, you can see their fins are kind of long. They almost remind me, I, I, don't, I, won't, I don't want to say they're like goldfish, but very different in the sense that see that long frilly fins, um, almost if you saw a steelhead next to it or a chinook, very different. Yeah, there you go. That's a, it's a really um, kind of a, they've got a long anal fin and a long dorsal fin and then I always say a little bit bigger eye if you're comparing the two, but anyway, there's some coho. Um, so they've got a long time. They they don't go right out to the ocean, whereas Chinook juveniles will go right out to the ocean. They hang out in fresh water all summer, have to survive through sometimes some difficult conditions. Um, and they don't move around a lot and they're waiting for the, the, the rains to then redistribute and start eating again. And then they'll be heading back out to the ocean potentially that spring, or they may hold a whole nother year over. I think I move on from that slide. In general, fish, um, juveniles need a certain, they need, temp they need the right temperatures to spawn. They can't be too warm. You probably hear in the Central Valley, sometimes they're having, you know, heat waves and, and they're not getting any survival for winter wrench enough because um, the river water is too warm. It's exceeding 56 degrees. We don't really, we don't typically see that here um, because we're in a cooler zone. Our water temperatures are good. It can happen up um, in the up, up further in the watersheds. But um, so what you're seeing here is just a picture of, of Casper Creek actually. And these are water temperatures from 2012 over a pretty long period. And you can see these kind of jump up and down. Um, it's, it's going from winter to summer. But we're not, we're generally not exceeding in a small coastal river like um, Casper, exceeding 16 degrees. So temperatures are, are okay. Uh, like I said, it's not to say that they, like the upper Garcia or the upper Noyo, they are gonna get warmer. 
um, what we're seeing trouble with this year is that the, the pool, they're actually losing water before temperatures are, are trouble. They're drying, you know, the, the small fish in the small pool are actually drying. Um, it can be very beneficial to have some warmer water for growth. Um, food, they often will grow faster. There's more food available. Um, and so it's not, it's not always a bad thing to have fluctuation in your water temperature, um, but long sustained warm water temperature um, that will kill uh, most salmonids. So. Um, and this phase is very susceptible to low flow impacts, um, have habitat fragmentation, sometimes water temperatures. Um, it can, back to spawning, truncate the spawning distribution, either not allowing them to come in or not getting up far enough up in the watersheds um, and condensing spawning down lower, which in a year like this, maybe that wasn't the worst thing because the fish are in cooler and warm water. Um, they would have gone up too high, they probably would have tried. So it just really depends on the watershed. But I just wanted to point out that very watershed dependent, but um, these are some um, real things that are we're really seeing this year um, with drying. And so increased stress, mortality, disease, decreased survival. And so then if they can make it through the summer, they've got this overwinter rearing period. And I'm going to talk about this in a minute, but a lot of our coastal watersheds have been um, the, we think that the overwinter period is a period that is limiting our production of fish because we have removed a lot of the structure that allows fish to get up onto floodplains and evade high flows and, and move around. And so that's why you'll see a lot of restoration work is fixing the rivers to increase that the structure and the complexity of the rivers. And so um, it's an important feature to have when you have high flows, they need refugia from the high flow. They wanna access good food sources up on floodplains. Um, and so that's a period where um, we are work, working or those in the community are working really hard to fix our rivers to get them back into shape for that. So, so once they, they make it through a winter and then that next year, they're gonna be going out in the spring. Like I said, Chinook have um, gone out. Our fish use the estuaries in these coastal watersheds to some degree, um, but not as much as, as some places. We have pretty small estuaries. And so a lot of times when they're going out in the spring, I know a small percentage stays in the estuary longer, most of them hop right out into the ocean. Um, and then they leave fresh water um, and they join the epipelagic zone of the fishes. Um, and they spend one to two summers out there. Um, like I said, steelhead will go back and forth. And one thing, um, I think the Science Center had a great talk on upwelling and um, a, a couple of months ago. And that's a really important um, part of uh, salmon ecology. They do really well in years when they're strong um, upwelling. And so they're entering into the periods out to the coast when that's, that's, that's happening. But we can relate good salmon um, conditions sometimes when we when we have those good periods of upwelling. So they are out there. Um, and when we have the warm marine blob and, and issues with that and transformations in the marine environment with the food, um, then we see effects to, to the salmon. Um, none of the fish that we have here you can fish for, the, the listed fish in the Mendocino coastal watersheds, they do um, they do mix with what they call out in the ocean. It's called mixed stock harvest. So they go out into the ocean and they're mixing with the other runs of salmon that people do fish for, um, the central variable Chinook, the, the Klamath Chinook. And so um, coho are out there. There's actually, and coho from up in the uh, Columbia will actually come down this far too, but there is no fishing for coho. So, so there is sometimes um, it, another reason it's really important to be able to identify the fish because they are mixed with the others and um, they are, they're not, they're not supposed to be harvested, um, but sometimes they do. Um, and I just, I put climate change up there. I keep, if you see that's a theme I keep bringing up. Um, I, I really, I'm trying to emphasize that, is that salmon, um, they're affected by climate change in the freshwater environment, but then in the marine, and, and we know the marine environment affects the freshwater, but there are one that they're really good indicators because they're actually going you know, to both places. And so they're going to be impacted. In, ways that other species may not be. Um, I just wanted to step back just real briefly about the watershed history. And, and I've mentioned several times our fish are in being, not in good shape. And 
some of the land use history in, on our coast is, is, part, is part of the reason why. Um, and so water back in the late 1800s, um, there was quite a bit of um, the logging began and the practices weren't quite up to date then. Um, and here's a, this is a picture I think of the Casper Mill um, I borrowed from the Chris website, um, but you can kind of see this is right at the mouth of, of Casper. And so um, we just, we didn't think the same way about fish then. And um, a lot of times we were right in the streams and pulling all the, the habitat out. Um, that rapid timber extraction was, and agriculture and society development hit uh, post-World War II and had more impacts on the landscape. Um, that it led to the loss of riparian trees, erosion siltation, channel simplification, loss of floodplain connectivity. And so we still have a lot of those legacy effects even today. Um, they recognized this fish crisis back in the 50s, but, um, and so action started getting taken even way back then. Um, they were <clears throat> removing block streams of um, logging debris, um, and there was a, what we call the sport fish restoration program, which still is in existence. That's where our license money goes. That's where part of my salary comes from. Um, and so that program started because they wanted to do something. I will say most of the effort around here went to small scale hatchery efforts, and that actually occurred from the 60s to the 90s. And so a lot of people aren't aware that that happened, but they were actually moving fish all over the place um, at that time. It was a, we do use hatcheries now to um, try to improve fish stocks, but we know there's issues with that as well. And um, I don't think there was much success for many of those efforts to try to improve production. As we know, our fish aren't um, at high levels. And so those, those ceased in the, in the 90s. But other environmental, um, Protect, Forest Protection Act and environmental species or the Endangered Species Act came up. So these were the things that started to really change the way we were working on the landscape and trying to protect the, uh, the fish. Um, there was a big effort um, in the 1980s and to clean the streams out actually because they had become filled with logging debris. And it was more of a restoration philosophy then. Um, we change, as we know, we go through time, we change sometimes. Uh, how we think about how to do different strategies. And so they were actually removing all the debris. Now we're putting it all back in um, because we know that's a really important complex uh, piece of the, what salmon need and what these watersheds need to function naturally. So we changed the restoration strategies from there. I do believe that things were probably really clogged up. Um, and so there was probably some, some of that necessary, but um, anyway. So now here we are. The decline sustained, and in the late 90s, uh, 28 salmonids uh, were federally listed um, up and down the coast. And so, since then, we've been working to. Um, they're on the endangered species list. That gives them new protections. And one of the most imperiled is here our Central California coast salmon, who's in danger. Who's in danger. Um, so, what does it mean to be endangered? And you have new regulations to protect them. Um, we have recovery plans that list out a whole bunch of things that, to do to try to get them um, back recovered. Um, there's real specific actions to reduce threats. That can be, um, I'll mention that in a minute, but it could be habitat, fixing the habitat. It could be reducing um, fishing, uh, pressures, different things have been um, happened since they become listed. And it also includes, and what my job is, inclu includes monitoring the value of status and trends. You need to know what you're managing, you need to know how many there are to manage. So our current monitoring shows that we still have very low populations and they're below uh, levels that are set in recovery plans, but we at least know <laughs> and we're getting, it's important to know longer term. And then from that, we make management decisions and, and hopefully try to move forward. I've mentioned this several times and I'm just gonna list these off again, but this intensity and shift in the water regime is something that is, Something we really need to keep an eye on here. It's going to be affecting the fish because they can't, the adults might not get in when they need to, and the juveniles might not be able to get out. They might not be able to distribute where they need, and you might have increased um, mortality when we're losing water all summer. Um, some of the, the marine ecosystem shift too, there's novel shifts happening out there where the food is not the same as was before, and so they might not get the food um, that they, they had. Some of those things are um, unknown. I think at this point, what's happening out in, in the ocean, we don't know how those shifts will uh, play out. Um, we've seen 
some of that with the kelp here locally. Um, we've seen um, one really interesting thing that I don't think we've seen in our uh, fish, but they've been seeing this in the Central Valley is there was a shift in feeding to, I believe it was anchovies and it raised levels of thiamine and the, and the salmon. And what, that ha what happened with that is if those adults came back, they went to the hatcheries, um, they were raising their juveniles. And I think they saw this in the wild as well. And the juveniles were having these defects. Well, it, it turned out that the, the mother was, had these increased levels of thiamine and it was causing these problems with the juveniles. In the hatchery system, they were able to give it a bath of like uh, vitamins or whatever it was to fix that and, and cause a problem. But it's kind of interesting to me that when you have food shifts out in the ocean, you, you have more anchovies one year, which I think that's a normal thing. There's a shift, you know, depending on if it's a, um, what kind of a year it is out in the ocean, but just things to be, keep our eye on. We don't, we don't quite know what is uh, coming sometimes. But some other key things that are um, we need to be paying attention to are illegal diversion, groundwater pumping. Um, I know we've got some great programs and people are working really hard on um, trying to, to improve this. Um, when you get small populations, you lose genetic diversity too. So it's still a current threat bottleneck. <clears throat> Intensifying the water cycle is what I like to think of it. We might not, we might get the same amount of rain, but it might be con condensed. Um, and that doesn't always work. I wanted to, and then along with that, here's another example. I showed you some flows earlier. These are mean daily flow, mean monthly flows um, for four different water years. Water year 17, that goes from October to October. Um, that was a pretty wet year. You can see what that looks like. Um, this is in the, hmm, sorry, I don't know if this is the Neuer or the Navarro, but um, it's one of the two. Um, so you can see what a wet year looks like. And then you can also see this black line is what a, an average year looks like. So that's many years over time. We do always have this fluctuation. Um, pop forward and here's our two years, um, 2020, 2021. You can see how much lower they are. You can see that we're having this shift where river flows never really came up till December. And that's it's getting on the uh, later end of when Coho want to return. Um, and then worse, uh, not maybe worse, but as bad, it kind of stopped raining in the spring the last two years. And so when that happened, that starts to disconnect habitat and fish are not, the juvenile salmon are not as able to get out to the ocean. So you can see in a more normal year, we've got high flows. This is their peak migration period going out to the ocean. Um, got some flows, but when you're running into this, it's definitely more challenging. I mentioned some of these strategies uh, for recovery, water conservation, habitat enhancement. We've been spending um, a lot of effort on this over the past 20 years or plus, I think. Um, and there's been a lot of investment and in, in resource um, towards this. So we've made a lot of progress, I think. Um, how's my time, Sarah? I don't wanna... Um, Drag. I want to make sure I'm not popping through. I don't have a problem. It's uh, 7.21. Um, okay. Generally, we keep to an hour. Okay. Um, but, you know, that, it, that I let you kind of lead that if you're, if you're getting real tired of talking and. No, I just want to, I don't want to get everyone me, tired of hearing me talk. I think I'm, I'm, I'm doing okay. And I'm, I'm going to get through our modern program and stuff. I just wanted to make sure everybody. Perfect. If I'm not covering too much, I don't want to, I don't want to no, no, exactly. drone on too long either, but um, good. So step, so step four with all that history and, and, the, and the background and the salmon. And so net, the monitoring firm, that's, that's what I do. And we're looking at status and trends monitoring. Um, the fundamental objective of that is to prevent the extinction of these species. Um, and we, uh, a way to do the monitoring, we're assessing viability in terms of four key population characteristics. Um, I'll show you what those are in a minute. But our coast um, and up and down the coast, we developed what we call the coastal monitoring plan. And so this is a salmon monitoring plan that has been being used all the way from up to the Oregon border down to, um, it's even, we're using for steelhead down um, all the way down to Ventura. Um, it's, a, it's important when you have a long-term monitoring kind of a program that you have 
um, consistent protocols, you have um, something that you can get out and repeat because we want to be able to look at, at trends over time, something that's affordable. Um, I'm not saying it's exactly affordable, but something that is, you know, you have to be funded to be able to do this. So uh, viable, so it's the viable salmonid population, VST conceptual framework. And what we're, the two that we're looking at is abundance when you have individuals in a population, if it's high, you want that to, it buffers the population. Um, when you have a trend that's going up, you want that to be high um, over time. And so that's the, our monitoring program is mainly looking at those, um, but we also look at spatial structure and diversity. Uh, monitoring success. We have annual estimates um, of the entire Mendocino coast. We've got a long-term data set building, um, standard data collection procedures um, set up. And we're estimating a large area to, and we're in reducing areas. We've got great partnerships. This doesn't work without partnerships. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, we have, and, and a lot of community support, we need landowner permission to go out and do these surveys. I mentioned that this program is, go, this is the, the squiggly lines you see in all these different population zones are places where our sample frame is set up in other locations. This is us. Um, it's important to think about salmon in a diverse way. It's not, you don't want just one population, you want a diversity of populations. And so it's important to try to maintain that up and down the coast. Um, so we're collecting data at different freshwater life stages and spatial scales. That is, it's a two-stage strategy. And so spawning surveys is the way we go out and count count the fish. There's different ways you can do this. Um, this is a consistent way that we found that it works well. And um, how you do that is you do red counts. Um, that sample frame, I would like to show you that. This is our sample frame. It stretches from Usal Creek all the way down um, to Schooner Gulch, but really the Garcia. We have 339 reaches. It's 500 miles. We do, it's a spatially balanced random sample. And so you have an annual a sample that goes through every year, it picks different spots. And so you're not um, over underestimating a particular area and it's, it's well distributed. Um, so it's about 40 reaches per year. Um, the second part is what we call life cycle monitoring. That's fish in, fish out. We have fish, um, fish in as the adults coming in and we get a census on these life cycle stations and we use that to calibrate the rest of that data. So when we're inferring that big population space, we're able to um, use these life cycle stations to know how many we get fish per red ratios, observer errors, we're marking fish. And, and so we know how many we actually visually see out on the spawning surveys. And then we also have, um, so I said fish out, we do smolt estimates. And when you get smolt estimates, you're, you're able to understand freshwater survival. And then when you have returning back, we, we understand marine survival. And here's the picture I showed you of our uh, distribution. Um, and here are the, the, the pieces we collect. We, in the end, we'll get an adult estimate, um, a small estimate and freshwater marine survival, and then information on growth. We, we mark our fish and we're able to see how big they grow and it measures the health. We also look at their life history strategies to know if they spend that one or two years in fresh water. And that's important for diversity. Here's a real quick view of our life cycle stations. We've got one on Pudding Creek. We have one on the South Fork Noyo. Um, Casper Creek, some of these are intermittent. We haven't, uh, but right, Casper Creek, we don't have going right now. Uh, Little River, we still have going, but maybe not the small traps. And then down here at the bottom, the Navarro. So we're trying to represent a big area um, where we're, we're monitoring this. Um, another thing these life cycle stations allow us um, to do is look, it's a platform for experiments and studies. So when we do a restoration treatment, we can use this fish data to understand if there was an effect. I think that's a really important part to understanding when you're doing a management or a treatment to understand if it was actually effective. Um, we've been able to determine some really interesting information. Like I mentioned earlier, when high stream flows, um, are negatively correlated with survival, suggesting that winter habitat is limited. And that's why we want to increase winter habitat. Um, we know summer is a low growth period. Um, and then sometimes we have some density dependence in streams. So those are some of the, the highlights we've learned from our life cycle stations. Um, 
and like I just meant, I skipped ahead of myself, but we can, we've made a lot of progress with restoration, barrier removal, road decommissioning, um, insulation of wood. So we've made a lot of progress, is it working? Um, and right now, we, we, I, I'm not gonna, I don't have time to get into these, but we've, we, ha we do have two projects at our life cycle station where we, where we looked at restoration of estimates. And so one was on pudding, one's currently going on 10 mile by the Nature Conservancy um, in a study called the Before and After Control Impact. And so we are able to look uh, more detail to see how effective these restoration projects are. Um, monitoring season, it starts in November and goes through May. We draw that sample. Um, we get landowner permission from many, many, many people. Um, I've been talking to landowners a lot right now. It's a great experience and we have a lot of support. It's very, really um, nice thing. And we go scout for reaches and we wait for rain. Um, here's just a zoom in of, this is the Navarro River and this red fish is where our life cycle station is on the North Fork. We census this entire section, which helps calibrate the rest of the Navarro. And then here's an example of these red squiggly lines are maybe our annual draw of reaches where we'll go out and hike and walk these and count reds every two weeks. And then we've got Elk Creek and um, Brush Creek and Alder Creek. And um, so actually I wanna say, where's your Greenwood Creek there too? So we walk or use boats to do these surveys. Um, we count the reds. I described what those look like earlier. Uh, we, we have measures to keep track of them so we don't double count. We also use live fish to actually make sure we're getting the right species since we have overlapping timing. Um, we have to be able to identify these fish in turbid water and by their backs. So we can't look at the mouth on the Chinook, but um, we get pretty good at identifying them um, like that. There's a with peanut markings on a Chinook and a more tapered anal fin. Um, and part of this, we also recover carcasses. And so we can get genetic information from these guys. Um, it's also part of this, uh, when we mark the fish, we're able to um, have an understanding of how many we were seeing out in the environment. Two places we physically handle the fish and we are marking them again to help calibrate these red surveys, knowing how many emails there were, how many fish per red, and how good we are at seeing them. Um, we have one of these fish traps on Pudding Creek and, and then at the, the egg collecting station on the, the Noyo. It's not an egg collecting station anymore, but that's what it's called um, out there. So we still operate that, that dam and uh, fish station for monitoring. Smolt traps, there's a screw trap. It's a spinning cone that collects juveniles as they're going out, out to the uh, ocean. And so from here, we can get smolt estimates. We know how many are going out. And um, we, this is a fight trap, very similar kind of setup, but it doesn't have a spinning cone. We check these every day and um, take the fish out, take some measurements. We also um, tag them with passive integrative integrated transponders. It's basically a microchip. And so that helps, it's a little spot there where you see that. That helps us to get efficiencies on the traps. We know our traps can't fish every single fish going by. And so when we mark them, move them back upstream, we can calculate how good we are at catching the fish. And then that helps us to get a good estimate. Um, we also, from these pit tags, we have arrays so we can learn about migration timing, um, growth, survival, when we do recaptures. This graph here up at the right is just a, a graphic that's showing um, fish movement in Casper um, and when they're going out to the ocean or maybe spending a little time in the estuary. These are coho, these are um, just numbers of fish on the left. And you can see on the bottom are months, April, May, June. And um, they're actually peak you can see is around between April and May when they're moving out, but it, you can see it extends all the way out there till almost July. So really in interesting information about when, they, when they're moving. So some really, uh, we, we can learn a lot from this. And here's some of the juveniles. Here's a coho, he's, he's a year old. And then we've got some coho young of the year as well. They're, um, they're just out of the, the growl. The scale is actually the same. So you can see the difference in size uh, on the measure board here. Um, and then here's another coho and he's real silvery. That's, you can really tell he's smolting. They lose these par marks that they have in fresh water and they're starting to get ready to make that transformation into the ocean. Um, another, a coho and a Chinook laying side by side. Um, 
there's some differences there. I was describing the coho fin being, the anal fin being longer here. Um, if you could see the Chinook, it's much shorter. Uh, they also have some differences with their par marks and, and their spotting on their back. Um, so we have techniques to identify them. And we do lots of safety training. We have these, we have incredible crews uh, come, out, come on, it's a pretty big team, um, and walk these streams all winter long. And so we do lots of, we do swift water training. We do, we're doing some knot training there. Lots of protocols, lots of safety. I'm going to skip that one because I really, I know I'm, I'm dragging long and you guys want to know how many fish came back this year, probably. So here are the CC Coho adult. And this isn't just this year. This is our data from 2009. I'm really excited that we we're getting this long-term data set. This is broken up by our major rivers, the 10 mile and the oil big. And the top you'll see, it's not completely additive, but the way we sample, we're able to do the entire coast. And so the dots with the lines are actually the, um, the entire Mendocino coast. So here we are, 2020. This is the 10 mile was one of the better, the best estimates we've ever had come back this year. It was a really good run. We actually had a decent run of coho. Unfortunately, it was met on these drought conditions. Um, so, um, but the good news is that there were a lot of them out there. And so hopefully, and we think, they are surviving in some places. Um, steelhead, um, similarly, we have a lot come back. Unfortunately for the steelhead, I, I think they may have gotten hit a little worse, just in the sense that they come up later, they spawn later, and we saw those graphs earlier, we didn't get the rain, and so it actually will dewater their reds. So I think there are places where they spawned and then they dried out. The other thing is, and I've, I've had several calls and there's, there wasn't a, there's not a ton we can do, but there are trapped adults in the rivers this year. So they couldn't make it back out to the ocean. Some are surviving, some probably didn't. Um, so you can just see how the different species can be affected a little bit differently. And then CC Chinook, we don't really have that many Chinook here on the coast. Um, when you think about the people fishing, those are Central Valley, Klamath um, out in the ocean. And so these are, we have pretty small populations. We had a fairly big run come back in 2017, but we haven't seen coastal Chinook here in a couple of years. Um, something that we want to be looking at a little bit more and understanding it. Um, they're, they're a little bit more difficult to detect, but um, they, are, they are very low in compared to coho and coho. And I just wanted to show one example of what it means to have this longer term life cycle monitoring and trends. This is Pudding Creek. We've been out on Pudding Creek uh, along with Lime Timber Company. They, they have that is uh, their property and we collaborative, we work with them on all of this work uh, to collect the data. And what I'm showing you here is coho abundance over time. We like to look at a three year rolling average because that's their life cycle approximately every three years. You look at one year, it could be really low and that's not necessarily representative because you have a three year life cycle. So we don't have trends necessarily um, going up or down, um, not significant. Um, and so, you could look at that as a, um, it's not bad, they're not crashing, but we, but, but they're not significantly moving up either. And here's just again, another piece that we can get about freshwater and marine survival. This is um, marine survival over time, and then also freshwater over time. And really this is just a number, this is smolt to adult surviving. Um, and this is three years later, how many smolts went out, how many came back. Um, I put these values here because these are average values. Marine survival is um, probably lower than maybe other averages. Um, and freshwater is popping around. But lots of details as, as to why. I know I don't have time to discuss that. In summary, um, just want we have we've had continuous data for the first time since their listing. Uh, we're well below recovery levels, but um, it's important to know that uh, we we have human and wildlife needs to compete for annual water resources and the demand is highest when it's least available. And so it's just something that I think this group knows and understands that it's something to keep, you know, really thinking about uh, forward. Um, we've made significant investments to, to build the stream habitat and build healthy ecosystems for resilient uh, future. And that's all I have. I talked, I apologize, I talked a little longer than I thought and I hope I'm getting the information, but I'm happy to um, answer questions for anyone who may have continued to stay around.
there's a picture of me and COVID uh, doing some fish work. And thank you for listening. Um, I hope that you got some bits of information and I'm happy to ask questions. Definitely, Sarah, that was, that was great. Thank you for, for giving us all a great lesson in coastal salmon. I just saw I'm in the dark here. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I know it, this, it's getting, yeah, it's dark out there. So let's just go right ahead. Um, if anybody has that question that is that they would like to throw out there, now's the time. Go ahead and put it in the chat, or um, if you prefer, we can we can unmute you and you can ask it directly. Um, that was really interesting, Sarah. I learned a lot. Um, I. Yeah, I, I've seen the uh, the spent salmon in the Little River watershed, and we live right on a tributary that falls down into the Little River watershed. And I cool, yeah. a couple years, but coming across a fish this big in a stream this big is like, what? How did you even get there? I know Little River is a place that we've done. Um, it's this is pretty long term monitoring in there. We've we consistently have done a similar survey out there for I think twenty five years or something. So. Awesome. Awesome. Could I ask a question, Sarah? Yeah. yeah so oh. I'm joining you from Canada, from oh. British Columbia. And uh, Sarah mentioned some of the work we do in Stellar Sea Lions, but I'm also doing a lot of re research now on southern resident killer whales and trying to figure out why they're in trouble. And I'm increasingly coming to the conclusion that the trouble's not here in British Columbia and Washington. It's actually in California. Hmm. And the trouble started for them in the 1800s. And it corresponds to those pictures you showed of all that logging and the destruction of the rivers. And in my, I've read some historic accounts, like the Sacramento River used to have four runs of Chinook, including a winter run. Yep. And they're and still there, but <laughs> that's right, but so yeah. few. Mm -hmm. And and the portion of the run which we know them best for is the time when they come to BC in the summertime and early fall. But I think historically. Um, that it was California that was the key to their survival. Hmm. And when I asked sort of sand biologists, like, what do you know about salmon, Chinook in this case? Mm -hmm. You know, what's the historic numbers? It's like, well, there's really no information. But I've heard some people say, well, once upon a time, the Klamath and the Sacramento, um, and these, these contribute over half of all the Chinook in the North Pacific Ocean. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's what it seems like to me from the, you know, the can I think cannery records are some of the big, the best ones to understand that. Um, ah. So uh, my question to you is, how can I get more information about historic numbers of Chinook? Because the numbers of Southern resident killer whales today it numbers 74 animals mm -hmm. and it's your report is just 74. But when we go back to 1960, 60 years ago, our first count was 78 in the population. And we and it appears that for at least a century, they've never exceeded 100. And yet mm. they must have numbered more once upon a time. And to me, the once upon a time is goes back to those old photos you showed. Yeah. And, and so I guess I'd like to find out from you how I can learn more about historic numbers and, and what what is the true benchmark? Because I think a lot of the times the benchmark has become well, let's talk about the 60s. That's what was normal. The shifting baseline. The shift. Yeah. I mean, we talk about that a lot, having a shifting baseline. Um, what we what's acceptable now, I would forget. I mean, that happens between you know biologists every year, um, less and less and less. And so um, I worry part, that just final point here, I worry that we're so focused on, you know, Puget Sound and Salish Sea and, and and meanwhile the whales are headed for extinction. Yeah. And nobody's talking about the food and their entire range and how important California is. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why it's being ignored. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't have an answer for that for necessary, but I, I can I'm trying to think about some of the that those historic records. And I I I want to say too, I thought they just made some changes with Chinook harvest um, up in Vancouver. I thought they did. I thought there was some new cha new change, but I'm I'm not sure. Like no, reducing... there certainly are restrictions on fishing yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. All yeah. designed to make more fish yeah. available. But yeah. our research is showing that that, that we can't find um, a shortage per se, despite the fact that salmon have gone down. Yeah. Fishing's been restricted to try to keep numbers stable. 
Right. And and I just don't think the trouble that's facing them is here. I think right. it's in your backyard. <laughs> it's always California, isn't it? Well, no. I don't um, want to point fingers. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I'm happy to um yeah, let's connect and I can try to, you know, get to, I, I'm trying to think of some spaces for some of the historical records. I mean, there's been a lot of work done on, um, I know a lot of the Central Valley biological opinion when they were uh, retooling that, you know, the killer whales were part of that um, because mm -hmm. we do know that the, the, the fall run are an important component of the, the food for that, for them. Mm -hmm. So I think that's known, but yeah, as far as like how many salmon there used to be and, you know, if that's, you know where's where's the trouble? I also thought uh, um, the the shift with when the gray when the whales um, populations declined wasn't there a shift? Didn't killer whales used to eat the? I'm speaking out of my zone a little bit with the marine mammals, but I thought that there was a shift there too. I know there's salmon eating um, uh, orcas, but then there's there was didn't know if that shifted over time as well. No, no. no. From we know historically, Chinook has always been their preferred salmon. Yeah. Yeah. And Shum would come in a distant second. Mm -hmm. And uh, sockeye begrudgingly. Mm -hmm. Well, interesting. I mean, how nice that someone from uh, so far away. You know. Really? Uh, well, we're part of the same system, the California yeah. current system. Yes. Yeah. All connected. Um, Patrice was wondering how one might get involved. Patrice Sweeney, uh, how one might get involved in, in counting fish. <laughs> Perhaps. I, uh, give me a call. <laughs> Great. Interested in doing this work, we are uh, hiring. Uh, there's actually a job flown right now for our uh, program. Um, it's through the Pacific States um, Commission or Fisheries Commission. I'm not saying that. Right. And it's it's on the website. I can share the link, but um, or or I can share my information and. I'd love to get a hold of you. We'll also be hiring some scientific aides to the department too. Probably. This work will start about November, so yeah. Awesome, great. So that's Patrice. If you're there, just yeah. Um, it looks like we can just put you in touch with each other. You can, if you want to, Sarah, go ahead and put that right up there. Um, she's on the ten mile oh, ferry. I know. I I think we spoke. Um, okay. Yeah. Connection made. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. Yeah, I know. How cool would it be to count the fish in your backyard? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. So so you you have each other's connection and um, looks like, does anyone else have any other questions to ask Sarah? Before we let her. Can you uh, hear me? Yes, Daniel, go right ahead. Yeah, hi, I'm a commercial fisherman for Bragg. And uh, <clears throat> my question for Sarah is that uh, both the uh, commercial fishermen, commercial salmon fishermen and the recreational fishermen have been talking about and seeing a lot of coho salmon out there. And of course, we have to release them and not bring them in. So they're not really identified, but um, do you have any idea whether those would be like coho from local streams or uh, from somewhere up in Oregon or? You know, I heard, um, I've been wondering that a little bit too. I, I heard there was um, some, from some of the, the coat wire tags they've retrieved, there has been some coming down from the Columbia. They were down pretty far at some point. Um, but I do wonder about that, um, you know, if they, it would be interesting to know. Um, if yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if, uh, you know, we have that genetic study mm -hmm. stuff that people are doing. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if, you know, might talk to the wardens and see if I, I know occasionally that um, sport, uh, they're uh, misidentified and that mm -hmm. people do bring them in. Maybe we could sample some of those and get an idea where they're coming from. I think that's a great idea. It would really, you know, help um, to understand that a little bit better. It, it's a little bit of a, I mean, that is one great program that you're bringing up, Daniel, about, um, you know, being able to do that genetic work and figure out, you know, it, it, it gets a little mystery what fish are out there. So, um, yeah, being able to um, understand that better and it helps to to set the regulations different when needed and 
or just improving the way I, I you're out there and seeing them. I, I haven't seen a lot in the ocean. I, I'm sure it is more challenging in the ocean to identify them, um, especially maybe not to you, but to, to someone who's not as experienced. Um, we kind of should know kind of a co-host. Yeah, yeah, personally, uh, I can tell the difference while they're still in the water behind the boat. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I know for uh, recreational uh, fishermen that um, it can be pretty tough mm -hmm. you know, not looking at all, them all the time. But um, I'll I'll check on this end and and see uh, you know talk to the wardens and see how many of them were actually brought in. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then. Uh, uh, can reach out to you or somebody else and maybe we can get some of those fish sampled next yeah, year. Yeah, I think that'd be great. It's not, it doesn't take much to sample them. You know, it's like a little, just a little filter paper and a little clip and doesn't take much stamp, uh, tissue to actually do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, I was actually involved in that oh. program on the commercial end, so. Great, yeah. Yeah, yeah so, all right, and uh, thank you. That was a very yeah. interesting uh, uh, talk that you did. Okay. Definitely. I didn't probably but, teach you too much. <laughs> yeah, hear you to the That's, fisher people oh. out there that you know it's 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 usually the fisher people who have that that historical knowledge, you know. And I see Fort Bragg as it steps forward in in having such a wonderful community of fisher people and biologists and people who grew up here that went away to Humboldt State and coming back to this area. And um, just some of the conversations to, in my mind, make a lot more sense today than they used to. They're, you know, it's not like they're the bad guys and they're the bad guys, but we've got to understand and, and glean as much information from each other as possible. Yeah, I, the, we can't lose the history, like, like <laughs> weaving it all together and knowing that we're going to make, you know, mistakes over time. And we might think putting wood in the, the <laughs> first isn't a good idea. And, but I mean, we have to learn and be adaptable and, um, yeah. and it, it is a cry. It's a, it's a crisis right now with, you know, with the environment and with the fish and stuff. We really, we do need to take as much action and work together to do what we can do to. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I, I saw Linda had a, was waving her hand. Hi. Yeah. Hi. hi, thank you so much, Sarah. This is just a fabulous presentation. I, I wish uh, I'd like to see it replicated over and over again. And, and I'm looking forward to getting a recording and hopefully we can share it around. Um, I work with the Mendocino County RCD. It's good to see you, Doug. It's been a long time. Sorry, and I um, also have a Navarro River Resource Center. So I mostly work in the Navarro. Mm -hmm. And um, a couple of things I just wanted to hopefully um, just quick comments and questions, but um, to, I think it was Daniel's comments just there. I have heard from, and I, maybe he mentioned this, but I have heard from fishermen, again, this is from a fisherman, but uh, who reports that you know they, they catch a, a fair amount of coho and it's a, and even you know they have to throw them back, but that their survival rates he said were low from that. So that was interesting for me to hear. I hadn't um, wasn't aware of that. So um, mm -hmm. uh, anyway, just another consideration when working with the industry, and that would be, you know, if there's a way to, you know, improve that somehow. I have no idea, but. Um, and then um, a couple of things I did do it. We went on a tour with the Coho Confab was just in the Navarro. We so sorry to have missed you then, but and um, but um, so I'm glad to catch you tonight. And um, we did a tour of the 10 mile project that the Nature Conservancy and Pronunsky Chatham are working on that showed to be um, they're doing these in stream structures, kind of massive wood structures that are um, engineered and um, piles driven in in the lower, just fairly middle of the lower end. I don't, I'm not as familiar with the whole 10 mile watershed, but they're seeing in a very short time some real improvements to their populations out there from what they were reporting and makes me just want to do that everywhere in all of our these North Coast streams, not all, but in the, in the right places. And Doug and I, you and I, we, you know, we would look, have looked at some of those areas in the lower Navarro and um, anyway, it was whatever they're doing. Some more of that. Yeah, and I, you, yeah, and they're they're like kind of the go go big, right? They've had some really big projects out there. And uh, the other thing about the, the ten miles are, it's different than the Navarro in the sense that 
it doesn't have the same kind of like land use. Um, it's, you know, pretty much one mm -hmm. land ownership. So it does have differences, but I, yeah, I mean, it, it, they are showing some, you know, they're starting with a, a pretty good, you know, system to begin with. And it's, it's an easier fix in some ways, I guess that's what I. Maybe so. I hope we can find some sweet spots in the Navarro yeah. that are yeah. somehow are similar. Yeah. And, um, the estuary issues, they all have a bar mm -hmm. that closes. And so I'm very interested about the bar. We, uh, as a kind of a watershed coordinator, we always get calls on the bar yeah. and opening the bar. It's very controversial. Um, just an aside, we're also seeing a lot more um, the in that Navarro, the harmful algal blooms are, with the drought is another issue that we're running into, especially in the estuary. And it seems like in our estuary, we just don't really have enough. We don't know, and we don't know enough. So yeah. I would to see us do more studies down there and understand life cycles and what's happening. And I agree. You know, it's yeah. just another thing on the list that, aside from possibly um, temperature and sediment, uh, maybe nutrients is something that we actually do seems like we need to address as well here. So. Um, yeah. Anyway, you know, Linda, I, I have just to comment on that. I when I searched back on some of the did some of the research on the historical stuff on the Navarro, they were actually there was a jetty on the Navarro. I think back in the either late 1800s or early 1900s when they were holding it open. So it it seems it's interesting again to go back on that history of that. Um, it's on the Chris website. If you keep kind of pa passing through, like it's amazing what they have tried for like what they were thinking about you know 100 years ago even. So. Very um, interesting. I would love to, um, you know, that's the kind of stuff, information I haven't um, maybe come across. So maybe you can help point that. Can't, yeah, I'll say it, it's kind of a, defunct. it doesn't really quite work anymore, but it, uh, it's, um, yeah, thank yeah. goodness that's there. What an amazing I know, it's just, it's all, so. this, it's all those really great pictures and stuff. I highly recommend it uh, out, yeah. And I'll just make a plug for the Mendocino County RCD. There's a, a web page on flow enhancement. It's it's if you go to a resources page on mcrcd.org, there's a resources page that is about flow enhancement that talks a lot about some of the work that it needs to be updated, but the work that's been happening on the flow enhancement side of things because we are uh, the Navarro got to zero CFS this year for weeks at a time, uh, literally stopped running. Uh, we haven't, you know, 76, 77, that would be another thing I would love to see is how this these two years compare to 76, 77. I haven't really seen good, you know, that that mapped out yet. And and your your graph on the two years side to side of where our flows got to mm -hmm. is just shocking to me. Um, maybe I misunderstood it, but um, it looked like there was still a decent coho run yeah. last year. Yeah, our, the bar, it just happens to be the bar opened at the right time. Uh, 2014, the bar did not open and we did not have returns. Um, yeah, and putting Creek Navarro, yeah, so. So timing is everything because it really wasn't open. You could see on that graph, it was like a little, you know, it was just a little teeny thing. So, um, yeah, it was, um, I mean, we just didn't get. Yeah, I mean, they spawned and now, you know, the young of the year, the, you know, the survival, hopefully they're adaptable and able to stay in those pools wherever they might be. Yeah, I, you know, we've done, a, a, just to let people know, we, and you've probably been out in the watersheds too, we have, we, we don't do a, you, you can risk rescue fish. That is one thing you can sometimes do in these situations, but then you have to think about where you're putting them. And so if you've already got fish, you know, stocked in a pool, you don't want to take fish from this drying and move them into another one. So it gets to be this real balance. It's something that the department can and sometimes does do, but it's um, it's not that easy. Uh, I, I know there's some places that that the water's holding. Um, there's places that it's it's drying up. And so um, actually some of the lower parts of the watersheds are better for them this year. So yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, but yeah, and I think I'm glad you brought up about the water conservation. I actually wanted to put a plug on the new the new water plan that just came out. Um, that it's really kind of a yeah, the nature we're, conservancy we're and, yeah. yeah and any tool that's on the shelf we are we are looking at it uh whatever is possible so yeah. uh happy to talk more about that or answer questions and check out uh, that resources page it's flow enhancement mm -hmm. is the under the resources so yeah. thanks again for this yeah. great presentation and uh, to noyo center uh science center for putting it on Absolutely. Thank you, Linda. Yeah, and then I think that we probably have to let it go here. Um, it's dragging on a little bit long, but I did have just, just that one question, that key question around um, if there is any 
information on the benefits of breaching the sandbars. And um, that seems like a big, big discussion. And I know that it is controversial and, um, you know, looking at those fish right at the end. And I was like, I want to start digging and let you guys go out to the ocean. That was, I forget when that was, that was might've been in February when it closed really early and there were a bunch of big salmon right in the end and there in it um, anyway. Yeah, it's, I, don't know if you want to... I think it's something we have to, I, I don't know if it's at the right management action, but I think that we have to really think about that. You know, I mean, it, it's, it is going to be, continue to be a, a trouble um, as we get these altered uh, rain systems. Um, so yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> sometimes it's improving the habitat upstream that helps that, um, but it, it might not be enough. <clears throat> Right, right. For example, like, you know, Pat's mentioning the 10 mile, it's, that's a pretty healthy water uh, shed. So it's a right. natural thing for it to close, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we shall see. I mean, I'm, I'm amazed at the, at the, the difference in the, like the, even the kelp forest this year compared to, you know, these last years and in, in how we see climate change coming and we see that it may be at something that's happening in a constant, but these ebbs and flows, like the great upwelling that we had and all those winds and all the anchovy out there and yes. the pelicans and, and the kelp forest growing bigger and colder water this summer, you know, it's like, maybe it's gonna swing back and forth, but it just, at least it feels nice right now when we're not just at a trajectory down the, and how much effect a little bit of change in temperature and um jet streams and whatever <laughs> I don't yeah know. well i think you're describing that 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 the ecological surprises you know it, it's not it's not necessarily going to be you know one exact we we have models that predict things but then it, it we know the temperatures are getting warmer but and the, the biology might respond a little bit different way that we didn't expect and um, right. it could be good it could be bad but yeah it's, it's really some of that's hard to model and, and tell just pay attention. <laughs> can, I guess that's what, what we can do is pay attention and do our very best. Yep. All right. Well, I think, did you I get had the little, teeny little thought? I'm sorry to interrupt. I had one teeny thought that when, when, when you're talking about the bar, and one thing that our understanding is, I just want to confirm this while I have everybody here, is that, you know, the, our understanding is that if the bar you know, is going to open when there's enough flow. So that's the one of the key things. So that if it's not opening, then their habitat isn't there upstream to support their fish is one way. And I don't know if that's a, you know, just a rationalizing and what's happening to them out in the ocean while they're waiting to come in. But, uh, and if they can just turn on or off their spawning. But anyway, I somehow have to trust in that right now, but we are working on improving flows. That's, it seems is a definite essential. Yes. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. I hope everyone has a lovely evening and join us again for these science talks. Um, and you can pick up the recording uh, by going to our website. And um, thank you, Sarah, for giving your evening to us. We all really, I think you can tell that you had some eager folks in the audience. People really enjoyed gobbling up this information. So thanks so much for sharing it with us. And You're welcome. And I'm always, you know, I, I, I love to talk to people too, you know, more details about things. I, um, so please, I work at the department. I'm not too hard to get a hold of. So please reach out. Thank you so much. And thanks everybody for joining and we'll keep, keep the conversations going.